just start running them on screen share. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. This is The Artist's Response with Elizabeth Stewart, and you're welcome to join us. Please stay tuned for a program produced by Richard Dugan and researched and presented by Elizabeth Stewart, who welcomes the great artists of our community. What follows is a conversation of an artist's experience about the artist's response to trying times, creativity, reinvention, recovery, and of course, flexibility, which is in fact the narrative of our present time. Or we can go in and out of break with some of those images, whatever you think. All right. Um, yeah, we'll play with it. Okay, here we go. In three, two, one, you're live. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of everything valuable and beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. Today we have the most beautiful topic in the world on our show about the arts and preparedness. And that is our family treasures. And what do I mean by our family treasures? I mean our dogs and cats and the pets in our house. I think you're prejudiced. <laughs> yeah, I am a little bit, Scott. I have Scott Haskins with me. And Scott's a, a friend of mine and an esteemed colleague, conservator and restorer. And um, he's an expert nationally considered on uh, emergency preparedness. He's been writing books on emergency preparedness since I met him, you know, years ago. So it's been over, I don't know, a decade or a decade and a half of writing mm -hmm. uh, about emergency preparedness for the government, for private organizations, for private people. I have his books. And his latest book is about how to handle your pets in an emergency and why pets matter. And um, he does a little introduction, which I think is fantastic. So his general message has been for a decade, as I say, how to save your stuff. But then he branched out a little. And how did he branch out? It's because during this pandemic, his dogs were a great, I don't know, emotional solace for him. And his dogs allowed him to get a little exercise, allowed him to reduce stress level. He's been extremely busy because of all of the issues around art and restoration not the least of which is dogs and cats because they're a little bit caged up at home as we are exploding into paintings etc so he's been extremely busy at the studio and he showed me a couple of pictures of um you know cat scratched 18th century oil paintings and this sort of thing it's just amazing but we are all cooped up and so are so are our animals and so scott looked around and he said you know i love my dogs and here i am and uh, there's a picture of him sunning himself on the back porch with his little Yorkie. Um, and there's my dog barking in the background. There's Bear. And there's Bear. And so he decided to write another book. And this particular book is in co-authorship with Diane Stevenet. I hope I'm saying that right. Stevenet. Stevenet. Okay. Protect Your Pet Guidebook. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why pets matter these days mm. and we're going to talk a little bit about scott's inspiration for the book and just a little introduction for scott uh he was trained in italy as a, a conservator and he has worked nationwide um when i try to catch him usually he's you know in la he's in new york etc but um he lives here in santa barbara um, his lab here in Santa Barbara is the Fine Art Conservation Lab. And if you don't know about it, or if you've got a, a, a piece of art that's damaged or needs cleaning, et cetera, Scott is your guy. Um, his multimedia book, which you can take a look at online, is SaveYourStuff.com. You can find it on SaveYourStuff.com. Right now, he's working on a couple big projects. Um, he's often worked for major churches when he's done, you know, extensive mural restoration, et cetera. Um, but the important thing about this particular Save Your Stuff series that actually has been going on since 1994, um, Scott's entry into the world of conservatorship was early on in the 70s, and he sort of hung his head as an expert um, in this particular market in 1975. So he's been doing this a long, long time. Um, the interesting thing, says Meryl Streep, about being a mother is that everyone wants pets, but no one wants to clean the kitty litter. 
And another quote, can you relate? Uh, Mr. Winston Churchill said this, I'm fond of pigs, dogs look up to us, cats look down on us, and pigs treat us as equals. <laughs> My dad used to say, uh, uh, to each his own, said the farmer as he kissed the cow. <laughs> yes. So the value of our animals and what they, our animals do for us in a crisis. Uh, first of all, Richard, do you have your mic close by? Richard, where are you? Right here, right here. Okay. I'm, I'm not near you. So how are Go things ahead. at the ranch regards your animals? Ah, uh, the ranch. Yes. Well, actually very well. Um, we are doing well with the chickens. The dog is now pretty much all healed up. He's not limping anymore, so that's nice. What happened uh, to the dog? Well, here's what we think happened. Uh, one Sunday evening, he came racing to the front door, or to the back door, I should say. And he, um, he was just beside himself. He was just so agitated and anxious and all a of this. Snake. Was no, it a snake? Was it a was snake? was not a snake. We later determined, because my wife could smell his breath. Now, he does not have bad breath at all. But for some reason, she could smell it. I couldn't. Anyway... Mm -hmm. We finally determined uh, from a veterinarian who we took him to for his shots and to have him checked out that it was probably a skunk. And apparently, in some instances, a skunk will give a warning shot, okay? It's not the full blast where, okay, now I got to go buy gallons of tomato juice and all that stuff. It was a shot, and it probably got him right in the mouth. Oh my and God. it freaked him out to the point where he must have lurched or jerked and stressed or strained his left leg or uh, uh, wrist or paw. I would lurch or jerk too. Jerk too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, but he couldn't apparently get out of there fast enough. And oh, that's that. what we think happened. It was a skunk. And we've had skunks up on the property. But as far as we have deer, we've got squirrels, we've got quail, uh, blue jays, we feed every day. We feed them peanuts. Along can with I ask chicken. you? Can sure. I ask you a question? So you're up there in the rural, up on mm -hmm. 154, mm -hmm. and so I'm down here, um, east side, Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I'm I'm in a pretty congested area in the condo here. Yeah. But I see so many more birds, and so I see so much more wildlife. Um, and do you know what the interesting thing is? That it seems that since we drive less and there's less airlines right. activity, you know, we've got so many more creatures, environments. I mean, have you noticed that up at the ranch? I'm going to say yes. As a matter yeah. of fact, uh, in the last three days, uh, these aren't exactly critters who are all about the property. But in the last three days, we've had two mm, fairly good-sized spiders in the bathtub. Wow. Now, last night it was... <laughs> yeah, train them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, apparently, I'm ready to did some checking, and this first one apparently is one of the most... It's more venomous than, I think, a rattlesnake, supposedly. Wow. I forget what it was called, a brown coat or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. This yeah. morning, there was another one in the bathtub. Now, I was shocked to learn from her that we could get it out of the tub and re put it back into nature... Uh, but it's not going to climb up the sides of the tub. And I'm thinking, well, how in the hell did it get in there in the first place? Maybe it but fell in or something. It must have. So anyway, I got a glass and a little piece of stiff cardboard. And I put the glass over the spider, slid the cardboard slowly underneath, uh, got him, took him or her out to the front door, put and tossed her onto the top of the chicken coop. And now she's on her own. So she'll either fall through and the chickens will have a delicious protein dinner or she'll move on, create a web, et cetera, et cetera. That you was know, a, brown, mean, a brown recluse and they are- That's it. You can lose your leg. Yeah. And, and of course, I'm in there this morning. I'm going to flick it to get it away from the edge of the tub, the curve, so I can get it with the glass. And just, don't do that. Don't. It's, you know, and she's warning you like crazy. But yes, I would say that, that wildlife has increased- I think because of what's what what we're going through, and yeah, that's I, I mean uh, that's really and it's really kind of cool. I mean we're still waiting for the bear to come back around. I have pictures of him in a in a, one of the big wading pools that we had up here years ago where he was splashing around in it, 
and then another where we uh, we actually saw him eating the plums off of the plum tree, oh, and then he got real annoyed with us, like, would you please? I'm trying to eat. Please <laughs> leave me alone. And he got annoyed, and he walked off down Stagecoach Road. I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. It was funny, but yeah, we've we've got an increase, and you're absolutely right. All right. So the it, the issue is we're talking all this hour about how to how to protect your pet, even though you are stressed out and you mm -hmm. are working like a devil from home um, and the pet needs as much attention as your work does in some yeah. cases. Mm -hmm. And we're talking with a pet lover and expert because he's just written a book, How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. And it's part of Scott's series. Now, I think there's four parts if I'm not wrong. Um, how to save your pet from a disaster. Save your stuff is the next in the line of the series of books. Save your stuff in the workplace. And the first book, which is um, a, a go-to for me, how to save your stuff from a disaster. And we're going to talk a little bit with Scott Haskins about what his inspiration to write this book was outside of the fact of his beautiful, beautiful little animals uh, there's Richard, she's showing us, uh, by the way, you can't see it, of course, because you're listening on the radio, but the cover of Scott's book and a beautiful woman holding three gorgeous animals on the front of the cover, How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. So Scott Haskins, Richard, let's go to a quick break. And when we get back, I want to talk to Scott about the the inspiration for this book and what, and then I want to get into um, his dogs and what what they're up to and how how Scott's researched for this book and all yep. that is just yep. a great topic for today. Okay, let's go to a quick break. It'll be fun. And we'll get back. Scott Hessen's going to tell us some clues about taking care of your dogs and cats, mm -hmm. even though we are kind of distracted these days. And your snake. And your bird. <laughs> and your bird. And all your right, bird. you're clear. You are clear. There we go. Yeah, this is, I think this will be a fun program. Um, let me see, what have I got here? I got that turned off. I've got a pretty good platform of people. And then uh, when we put the video together and we splice in some, uh, some of the photos and stuff, uh, we, could, we could have 50,000 people watch the video. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, when we come back, uh, when we start coming back with the music, I'm going to uh, start throwing some of those photos up. Uh, and... Um, and uh, I'm going to move forward. Yeah, we'll start with that one. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Jump back. Jump back. There we go. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll play. I'll put some of these photos in as we go to break and come back from break. And then I'll jump back to the live screen with the three. Okay? Good. Richard, are you playing my music? You are? I okay. mean, I am, yes. Okay. Uh, no, the music is playing and, and the commercials are running right now. Okay, so I, I picked some, so, I don't know if you saw, Scott, I picked some dog-related Yeah, I loved them. Oh, I loved oh. Stuff. okay, I did not see that email, unfortunately. Okay. I didn't see that one. Um, do, you want was, me to, do you want me to send it quick? No, no it's okay. not. I, I, between all of the things that I'm going to try to do for this video, I'm going to okay. see if I can't uh, put we'll some of these photos best. in and out. Yeah, well, yeah. Three free songs. I'm sorry? Were those royalty-free songs, Elizabeth? So the issue is when Richard does anything with for us, he uses the, the FTC says if you use a small clip, it's royalty free. So we can't go over a certain time. What is the um, time? What, what is the time, Richard? Uh, it's like two, two, two point something seconds. No, 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 no. It's not by the second. It's not that short. No. You can usually use between 30 and sometimes 45, although we've got programmers who use a lot more. Yeah. But it, you don't want to use the whole song, but you can use snippets. And of course, the way I do it for Elizabeth's program, whatever song she provides, I'll take the front end and I'll use that as a rejoiner to the program because it's at the beginning. And I'll use the tail end of the song for maybe 30 seconds uh, for, the, uh, for that portion. Okay, we are coming back. Stand by. In three, two, one, you're live. 
Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm talking with my colleague and dear friend, Scott Haskins. His recent book came to my attention and I thought, wow, this is so prescient. How to save your pet from a disaster. And we're going through a slight disaster now. So, you know, fire season's coming up as well. Yeah. Um, it's just an interesting thing when I think about a quote that Scott sent me last night. So you think you're taking care of your pet. Your pet is probably taking care of you. All right, Scott. So um, I wonder if you'd reflect on that. So what evidence do you have that our pets are concerned about us in this COVID pandemic? Well, as I considered uh, writing the book, I was, of course, uh, immediately confronted by people's opinions about how important their pets are. And, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more than just kind of, okay, I got to take care of my dog. It's my responsibility. No, no, it's heartfelt. It's emotional. It's, uh, it's, it's super important. And, uh, the, and it's like furry children or, or, or feathered, feathered babies. And um, the idea of, okay, I have the responsibility of taking care of these children. As I talk to people, it became immediately um, evident that these pets provide, I mean, even if, even if they're not trained to be formal therapy dogs or cats or animals, they provide an amazing amount of, of, of therapy to people. And it's, a, and I asked you, I asked you about it. I talked to uh, you about your dog, about Bear, and you were, uh, and you were uh, very complimentary, very enthusiastic about all the comfort that you receive, the evening out of your moods, the, uh, the, 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 the bounce in your sense of humor, and uh, the leveling out of your emotions, all happening because uh, you've got this little guy that, uh, you know, that, that looks you straight in the eye and you melt. Am, am I right? You're right. You know, it's an interesting thing. So I have a vet here in town, Peggy Larned, and Peggy runs Artemis Animal Clinic. And Peggy is a holistic veterinarian. And so she does, um, she does energy readings on the dog and she, she's done energy readings on bear. She just fairly recently because his liver was acting up. And so um, we, you know, met her in the parking lot with our masks on and she kind of, you know, kind of did her thing with, with Bear. And she said, you know, he's holding a lot of um, anxiety for you, Elizabeth. He's holding a lot of anxiety and he's, and it's, it's something that is um, anchored in his past and your past both. And he's mm -hmm. holding these emotions for you and somehow that's affecting his general well-being. You know, dogs are little energetic creatures and they have this, um, they pick up on energy. You know, they know when you're not well, they know when you're in, in, a, in a funk, they, they know when you're distressed and they, they respond to you. And so something in, in the, the dog's past and something in my past mesh mm -hmm. because of the anxiety level of this crisis and so she gave me some um, ways to actually kind of massage his spine and get that out of his mm. nervous system, central nervous system. At first I was like, oh, can't, this can't work. You know, his liver readings won't go down because of um, me stroking, you know, his spine in a certain way, but lo and behold, they have. Yeah, that's not true. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. he holds a lot of my energy as a, a negative energy and, and he tries, I think, to take it away, but it, it, it kind of glues on to himself somehow. I, I don't understand it. Well, we, we don't understand uh, the uh, energy levels or the capabilities or, of, of pets, but let me tell you something a little odd. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother, uh, for no effort on her own, my grandmother would walk outside her door and dogs and cats would come from all over the place. And she was like, she was like Pied Piper of the neighborhood animal kingdom. And I, and I've inherited part of this unseen vibe that, uh, and, and, and I can't tell you how often I go to people's homes to uh, consult for artwork and I meet with people all the time. 
uh, and, and, and talk to people about their artwork. They call in and say, hey, I've got this, or I've got that. And so I'm all, I, I just got back from Salt Lake City meeting with clients in Las Vegas. I'm on my way. As soon as I finish this interview, I've got to meet with clients in, uh, in South Orange County. And I, I come to the house, and I can't tell you, maybe eight out of 10 times I walk in the house, and the cat or the dog comes up and says hi, and the person is looking at me with this blank look that says, what the heck? I was just, I was in Park City, and I walked in, I walked in the house, and the lady looks at me, she says, wow, what, who, who are you? And I, well, I'm an art conservator, Scott. And no, it says, my cats run for the hills every time somebody walks in the house. And I had one rubbing on my leg, and the other one sitting on the, lo on the chair looking at me. She says, they never act like this with anybody. And I get that all the time with cats and dogs. And um, so the idea of animals reading us is, uh, is something that I've, I've seen in my life, not because I've read a book or, or, you know, or studied voodoo or something. It's just something that I see around me all the time. And, so, uh, so, so, Richard, um, so I, I know you've given me the sign. We have to go to quick break. <laughs> so, so, um, John and I, um, John's my photographer, my partner, et cetera. We, and we work together when we appraise, we go to a house. If we go to a house where there's cats, the cats glam on to John. Cats love him. Cats hate me. Uh, they hate me. They don't like me. Dogs like me. Dogs kind of like John, but cats love John, and cats avoid me at all costs. So mm -hmm. I think you're either a cat person or a dog person. Richard, how about you? I'm both. Well, yeah, and I would tend to agree, and here's an interesting uh, scenario with our dog, Angus. He's, we finally got a true weight when we had took him to the vet, 106, not 120. Whoa. 106 pounds. Anyway, most of the yeah. time, anybody comes to the house – or we would take him in the truck somewhere and somebody would walk by the truck as we're sitting in there with him. Uh, he would bark at them. Not, you know, the, the furious frantic kind of thing. Just like a bark, roof, roof, like get away. You need to move away. Well, my wife's ex came to visit. They're still very good friends, which is wonderful. And <clears throat> my wife didn't think that he would be coming into the house with her, which was still okay. Not one bark from Angus went right up to him sniffed him a little bit and it was like they were fast friends and I thought wow that's that's incredible and I think I have a, a just a, a basic answer for you uh, Elizabeth as far as cats and dogs for you because your primary animal is a dog the cats know this they sense this and they're not real fans of dog lovers <laughs> I, I just a theory of mine. I love the joke someone told once or the line they said that um, the dog, when the person, the owner comes home, is like, oh boy, they're going to feed me, they're going to take care of me, they're going to do all these wonderful things for me and da 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 and it's so great. It's like, oh, God is coming home. And the cats are more like, I'm God, serve me. <laughs> <laughs> I also think with with in my case, I, um, first of all, Angus weighs more than me, and I'm just the, you know, there's a lot of nervous energy around me, and I think cats don't like that. Maybe uh, so, okay. and then they're, you know, John's more laid back, and that maybe that's be. part of it. That but I, I like be, what yeah. you're saying about this energy reading, and I think Scott, when we get back from the break, we'll have something to say about that, and then we want to get into Scott's. Um, prescription for how best to take care of an animal, how best to, I don't know, like with kids, you know, if you're going through a stressful situation, you can kind of try to mask that you're going through that situation. But with an animal, you cannot, they read it. So I wonder if Scott can tell us a little bit about what he's learned in researching this book. And by the way, the book is quite hefty. He's done a lot of really interesting research. So when we get back from the break, Scott's going to give us... Yeah, okay. what, what's good? We'll talk more about it. <laughs> okay. When we get back from the break, we're going to talk more Great. about How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster, Scott Haskins' latest book. Don't turn that down. All right. We're clear. Music's playing and all that good stuff. I have to tell you that, uh, um, you know, earlier you're t she was talking about how the animals react to individuals, the, the, the owner especially. And when my wife is not feeling well, 
hmm. or she's having a, an asthma attack, a coughing fit or whatever, sneezing. Oh, he's right over by her, just yeah. nervous as I get him. Same as our house. Yeah. And I tell her, uh, she, 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 uh, most of her reactions to his behavior are, isn't that crazy? And I would say, no, it's not. It's not crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. That's because the two of you are bonded. Yeah. Um, and I still remember an experience when he, when we first got him, uh, we got him on the 14th of February, 2013, and we brought him home and we were in the backyard with my other dog, Makushla, and we let him go over, uh, one e that evening before we were going to sleep, we let him go over to the, uh, water bowl, which that year we had freezing temperatures. So the surface of the bowl was ice. Mm. He took one lick and he was shivering like you would not believe. Amrita just pulled him up. It's close to her to get him warm. Took him in the house. Took him into bed with us. It's the only time he's ever peed in the bed because Ooh. obviously he was that scared. This was his first night with us. Mm. But he was also freezing. And mm. oh my gosh, it was really something. But mm. when they bond to you, they pick yeah, up my, on whatever's my, going on. My wife had a stroke uh, last, uh, at the end of last year, last September, and the dogs glued themselves to her and, and you know, yeah. were right there for the whole, for the whole process. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they were, I mean, it, it's not something you teach them. They, they just feel. It's they, just what they do. Yeah. And, and you should thank them. I mean, you should just thank you for, you know, your energy and so forth. Because not all, they're not always nervous per se. It's. Sometimes they're there to help to calm you down. Right, exactly. It's my point. Yeah. They're there. Yeah. They, exactly. They take care of us. Exactly. All right, we're coming back <clears throat> in three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Sturm speaking with my dear friend Scott Haskins, who's written a new book, this fourth in the series, How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. And before we get too far, Scott, how can folks find the book? Uh, they can't <laughs> because okay. it's published yet. You are you are on the cutting edge. We are. Uh, I mentioned to you that uh, I that I had a, a a a New York Times top ten best selling author that uh, had uh, off, had um, proposed or or to do the forward, and he was so enthusiastic about this book. His name is Raymond Aaron. He's written two Chicken Soup for the Soul books. He was so excited about it, he proposed our, our manuscript to an organization that is awarding us an international book award that we aren't going to get till September uh, at a big event in Toronto, Canada. So uh, I've just finished uh, the second version of editing and uh, there and you know all the you know the covers done everything's done we're going through formatting right now and I'm hoping to have in hand a copy of the book in about a month. Fantastic. And you know, dear listener, we are looking a little bit and you can't see unless you, you know, Google this um, presentation after the fact, but uh, Scott's included some wonderful pictures of works that he's restoring <clears throat> because of animal t damage to the, to the fine art and also some great loving images of, of is that your dog, the little Yorkie? Yeah, that little Yorkie, actually, he was a, he's the largest Yorkie in the world. He's like 15 pounds. But he, uh, unfortunately, he had liver failure uh, <laughs> about a month ago, and we had to let him go. Yeah. So the, the fun thing that, you know, we, Richard was mentioning was that, you know, uh, in illnesses, pets tend to understand. And I can remember I was in an accident, and I shattered um, my pelvis on the left oh, side. Goodness. And... Uh, Bark, my dog now, had a predecessor, Bear, and Bear lived to be 20 years old. And it was also a Dachshun, and Bear, um, I didn't know how severe this particular accident was for me, but but Bear did, and sorry, Bark did, and Bark um, would crawl in bed with me and lay on that wound, wow. and he wouldn't leave that side, so it was a, it was an injury to my left side. And he wouldn't leave my left hip. And and basically, I had to like peel him off of myself to get out of bed. And the interesting thing was, 
after after a couple of weeks, he started to limp like I was limping on his left side. Sympathetic. The dog. Angry. Sympathetic, yes. Yeah, I mean, and there was nothing wrong with him. I, I took him to the vet. She said, there's nothing wrong with his left side. He's just, you know, she saw me limp on the left side. And he said, she said, the dog's picking up on something, mm. you know, picking yeah. up on your injury. I mean, amazing. You yeah. know, it's, it's, uh, that's interesting because between the dog, the cats, the chickens, and us, whenever one of us has an injury to say our leg or what have you, whatever side that is, he sort of kind of does that. And it was his left side. It was his left front leg that was, was, uh, was strained. Um, but we have a chicken, one of our chickens. No, right? you've got to be kidding me. The chicken doesn't pick up on your energy. The chick, this is the second chicken that we've ever had who has a lame left leg the second chicken that we've ever had and her name this 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 girl's name is luna and uh sometimes i'll i'll pick her up out of the coop and i'll help her down you know she has a little trouble leaping up onto the ramp but uh, she can do it because she'll flap her wings like crazy you can you know when she's coming out of the coop but i find that fascinating that that that's a, that's what happens with our animals is they take they almost take on the the uh, empathic if you will uh attributes and who knows maybe they're taking them on you remember that old star trek original series episode where the woman she was an empath and she would take on their stuff and she would draw that out of them and it would show up on her and then she would dissipate it. i have a feeling that cats and dogs do that well okay scott now i want to talk to scott about prescriptions for disaster preparedness for the pet. So what would you say, Scott, would be the very top of your list? Well, uh, I'm guessing that in an emergency situation, I mean, of course, you might have, uh, you know, a broken water heater at the house. That's a disaster for the house. It can cause a lot of damage. But um, let's say in our area, we live in earthquake zone. Uh, we live in wildfire zone. Obviously, we've also uh, found out that we live in mudslide zone. And so you've, uh, there's a chance that you might have to take off. And we often, uh, we, of, we often travel with our pets and, you know, in our cars. And so the whole idea of having uh, everything safe in the vehicle, in other words, how to travel with your pet is a big deal. You don't just like let the dog get in the back of the, you know, in the back seat and then drive on down the road. So there's so many, uh, and then, uh, you know, one of the biggest add on stressful situations that could happen is when you get outside the house and everybody's nervous and everybody's stressing and it's not a normal situation, the animal gets freaked out also. And so what happens if, if, they, if they're not on a lead, I mean, normally they would walk with you, but what about if they bolt? And so uh, are they microchipped? Uh, do they have a? Do they do, do they have their collar and their license on them? Uh, you know, are they going to get into something like uh, something they're going to eat that's not good for them? They're so nervous. Uh, are they going to get dehydrated because they're not? They're so nervous and and crazy. They're not drinking, or they're drinking impure water. That's bad. I mean, there's just so many booby traps for these uh, beloved members of the ho of the family that unless we think ahead a little bit and take the precautions, you know, have a, have a grab and go kit for them, things that will calm them because if they're calm, they're going to take care of you. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing is that you're not just fulfilling a responsibility. You're also helping yourself. Go ahead. So, um, you know, the issue I think that we're dealing with is, is right now with um, all of us working from home, except Richard, he's the only person that I know of that still comes into work every day, but you know, and thank you for that, Richard, but we're working from home. And so, you know, I can remember when I moved to the house from my office, Bear didn't like it. He, he, he kept on heading for the car and he wanted to get in the car and go to the office and sit behind me in my chair and this sort of thing. And he, he, he was kind of grieving that the office was gone. It was really phenomenal, but you know, the issue is how do we, so we're so we're very distracted at home, and I think I'm not the only person that 
because the computer is always on at the house, I'm always working. I mean, so, you know, it's like I, in the office, I could turn off the computer and go home, but because it's here, I'm always working. And you know, I feel like I'm, I'm less with the family than, than, uh, than I should be because of the fact that, uh, you know, my office is in the house now. So how do we pay better attention to the dog, Scott, um, or the cat? I think it partly, uh, if we're, I mean, I'm not talking about general care. I'm, again, I'm talking, you know, what you said that, you know, when we, when an emergency situation comes up, uh, you're scattered, you're, you're, you're not, uh, you know, you're, di you're disoriented, uh, you're not focusing, and you may not think of a bunch of stuff that needs to be done to take care of those around you. And so uh, preparing ahead of time, you know, the, the definition of a disaster is an emergency situation you haven't prepared for. And so that is uh, in, applied to our pets. Now the impetus for writing the book uh, is that uh, a lot of times people will be, uh, the other things that people are anxious to say, the other treasured items in their house that they're anxious to save are things that they can't insure. Uh, most of the time people don't insure their pets, but they can't and usually don't insure things like heirlooms or the family Bible or love letters or original old photographs or whatever these family history items are. All the items in the family that help to document the heritage and the legacy of the family, where they've come from, what they've been through. All of these things are so important. And these are treasured items that, uh, once the, I, you know, in, in Santa Barbara, we had the painted cave fire. How long ago was that? I know some people that are still crying over photographs that they lost of their kids uh, from the painted cave fire. So uh, it's, it's heartbreak that doesn't really heal that well, especially when you get very, um, you know, when you start thinking about the past of your family and your family history, your animals are part of that treasured part of your personality that is, you know, they're part of the family. And so um, I, I have several, pay, uh, several items in the lab now, uh, valuable heirlooms. Uh, one is a, uh, a treasured uh, Buddha statue that were busted up and ripped because uh, they were put, it, they, because they uh, came into contact with, uh, you know, a hundred pound dog or, uh, you know, or a crazy parrot that was scratching it up or, I'm uh, going to LA tomorrow to look at a painting that's all busted up because of a cat. And uh, the how did the, how did the cat get to the painting? Uh, it uh, the painting had I'd been taken off the wall. They were moving stuff. You know, it happens all the time. You take something off the wall to paint or rearrange things or or to yeah. take it off to show it to somebody, and then there's access to it. This was I think this was actually hanging up by a shelf. And you know how cats climb around the climb around the house and uh, they and the cat got to this so <laughs> the, the connection the connection here is yes uh, these are valued items for our that you know for heart health so to speak and so I've tied in pets and your collectibles and heirlooms and uh, you know the artwork a lot of the things that you can't insure and uh, that uh, that you can't replace you can't get another one uh, you can't get another. You can't get another bear. You can get another dog that is sweet and you love it, but it's not bear. And you can't replace the family Bible. You can't replace the old photographs. Uh, you it, unless you know you've got them on the cloud someplace and you've prepared for the disaster. Anyway, that was kind of the that was kind of the impetus and uh, and why I wrote the book. But there's also another end of it. Uh, if you want to hear about it, it doesn't yeah. have to do with pets. Um, have I got time? Let, let, let's, uh, let me stop you right there. Just Richard's giving that break sign to me Great. Okay. Uh, via Zoom. So let's go to a quick break. And then the, the, the other side of the coin we'll come back to when we get back from the break. Don't turn hey, that down. This is right. Back, in with, back with Scott Haskins and his new book, How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. All right, you're clear. Then I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, Punch through some of these photos again. There's Stelina, all ready to go in the back. Yeah. That's cute. <laughs> yeah, Giancar Giancarla is on it. She's got it all. 
These these were our three Yorkies. This was one of the greatest dogs I ever met. Oh. This dog was like 150 pounds, hated, <laughs> hated men, and I couldn't get him off of me. He was just, <laughs> I couldn't get him, he was just all over me. He was just, he was a great, great, great dog. I I called, his name was Jake, I called him Jake the Great. Ah, there's a good one. Yeah, that's a cute picture. Yeah, yeah. my uh, my precious Makushla, we had to let her go October of 2018. Her hips went and uh, yeah. and uh, and so forth, and we kept her around for another 14 months, caring for her diapers, pee pads, the whole shoot and match. Yeah. And finally, after 14 months, my wife finally got on the same page as me and said, "Okay, this is a great picture. This actually looks like my wife's last dog, Connor, who yeah. was a, a shepherd." chow mix and he is dialed in uh, this the owner for this lives out uh, towards riverside and for this dog and uh she's got everything she needs to safely transport this dog they go yeah. Uh, oh she, yeah they can be on the move immediately and every yeah. got everything she needs to keep him safe and uh, yeah well, we uh when we traveled from phoenix to santa barbara we were taking two vehicles our subaru which my wife had a uh, U-Haul trailer behind it. And she had four cats in a crate that we tried to sedate. And one of the cats uh, decided that they were going to eat all of the sedation and was as loopy as can be for four days. Oh, uh, I had a big Siberian Husky and my Makushla, but she also had her chow uh, mix, uh, shepherd chow mix Connor in the front seat. He had a seat belt, he had the harness, the whole thing, so that he was secure. It was the most amazing experience I have ever had. All right, we are coming back, kids. Stand by. <clears throat> In three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm talking with Scott Haskins, who's a disaster preparedness expert. This is his fourth book, Forthcoming due to be published this fall, and it is How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. And we talked a little bit about, you know, the uh, our area, Santa Barbara, you know, we, we often take off because there's a fire, there's mudslides, there's something happening, and we got to leave town. And Scott was saying the importance of, um, you know, thinking ahead for our pets, you know, preparing a proper harness, a proper seat, having a grab and go kit for the dog with medications and food and this sort of I'm thing. Yeah. So, so Scott, you, you were telling us the other side of the coin when we went to break. Well, about writing the book actually is in, is right in line with the subject of your program because we're in this COVID-19 crisis and uh, we're all stuck at home. And, um, and so the idea of, you know, what can artists do? Uh, I'm not an artist, by the way. Uh, I have never painted a painting in my life. My love of art and our skills and professional uh, treatment of artwork to preserve it and restore it doesn't have anything to do with creativity. I'm not an artist. But I have written books uh, in order to reach out to people and give them at-home advice about protecting, preserving, uh, and maintaining their, their art and collectibles and heirlooms. But artists uh, have, uh, you know, ha your, your idea that artists can contribute to society and what do you do to help relieve the tension of the crisis? And uh, there's, there's so much can be done. My, uh, you know, my opinion is one that, uh, that maybe artists have uh, the ability uh, better than anybody to get involved, get involved heart and soul into a project and screen out the rest of the world. Screen out the problem. Just turn off, uh, you know, social media and turn off the news, and and dive into the my co-author on this book uh, painted like a 180 foot fence with a mural on it out in the middle of some agricultural field up by I think San Luis Obispo or Santa Maria. Uh, she just like uh, just uh, uh, you will not uh, hold her down creatively. The, but the idea of, of getting involved create, creatively is, uh, is something that can 
not only save your own soul and uh, your own stamina. You know, the question here is emotional resilience. That's that's kind of in my I've kind of boiled it all down to emotional resilience. And if your emotional resilience is solid, you're going to be of help to people all around you, and you're going to be of help also to your community. In this case, uh, I connected with a guy that uh, helped me to uh, bang out this book and pull, pull all of my resources and put it together. And uh, it's been it's been a fantastic. And if anybody wants to uh, you know, wants to email me or call me. Uh, my email address is f a c l a r t d o c at gmail dot com. F a c l art doc at gmail dot com. And write me, and I'll be happy to you know give you the name of this fellow that helped me get this book out of the way. And then the other thing I did was I uh, signed up to kind of get more up to date about. Uh, marketing my uh, services and my book on the internet. Social media algorithms are changing all the time. Uh, what you thought was good five years ago uh, now is not the same game. And so, um, and I've got, you know, I've got another person that I'm working with on that to up my game with that. If somebody's interested in know, knowing more about these guys, I've done a lot of research to, to, to connect with the very best and I'm happy to pass along uh, their names. But the idea here is one of emotional resilience, and, uh, and that is a part of taking care of your pet. It's also part of taking care of these treasured, treasured things that belong to your family's heritage and your collectibles, and uh, has to do with uh, being stable for other people around you. So <clears throat> when we get back from the break, Scott, I want to ask you a salient question. I have noticed you know, uh, uh, many of my clients are going through their, um, as you say, uninsured treasures. In, in other words, things you can't insure. So, and I find in my own life right now, you know, I have a, uh, unfortunately, even though I counsel people on how to sell things and auction mm -hmm. procedures, et cetera, I myself have two storage lockers that cost me 300 bucks each a month. And I've got so much stuff in there, you know, from years of collecting. And right now what I'm doing is because I have <clears throat> a little bit stir crazy in the afternoon, I go to the storage locker, nobody's there and I don't have to be worried about contagion, but I'm going through old photos right now and mm -hmm. I'm scanning them to, you know, to the computer and I'm actually in a space in my mind where I'm um, actually retitling them and so you know it's like well I, I, I'm kind of like thinking well in these days when you know dear friends may not be here too long because of the illness and even family members you know my mom and dad both tested positive for this disease you know they're in their 90s so I'm thinking let me you know make a record of the family treasure so I've been you know Oh. Taking post-it notes and saying, well, this is when dad did this and mom did this and where the, we were and this sort of thing, where it didn't really matter in the past. But now That's it seems that it's become, yeah, it's become more central. I think for a lot of my clients, I've been getting questions like, if you had a, a free couple of days, let's say, and work was kind of not real urgent, you know, what would, how, how would you best think about, let's take the family photos since we're talking about that. I want to know your prescription for what you would do if you had a box full of family photos, Scott, and I'm sure we all do, cardboard box somewhere, what you would do to kind of get a handle on those photos. It's a little bit of deviation from our topic, but Richard, we, do we have to go to quick break one more time? Let's go to quick break. When we get back from the break, I want Scott to address what I've been hearing from a lot of my clients is, you know, I've got some treasured things, family photos and old books and scrapbooks and uh, paper, em ephemera. You know, what What shall I best do with my time now that I've got that time? Don't turn yeah, that down I'm back with Scott Haskins. Exactly what you need. Good. To okay, good. Don't turn that down back with Scott Haskins. All right, we're, we're clear. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I have... Uh, our family photos, my wife's and mine, uh, <clears throat> they're not even at the house. I've got them somewhere else. But I would love to sit, like she's describing, with a scanner and just one at a time, just 
pump them on in. And I wish there was more of an automated way of doing it where you could put them on a conveyor belt of some sort and it would self-orient them and, and trim them and so there forth. Actually, there are actually some genealogical services that will do that for you. Oh, wow. You can send them 5 million photos and you'll get them all back on, on high resolution digital format. Yeah. When we went to Ireland, uh, both the first and second times, the first time we took those disposable uh, analog, if you will, cameras, I took them to the place where we went after we got home. And <clears throat> then they gave you a link to the website where you could download the digital format. Second time, I took digital cameras with me and I was able to transfer from the card right to the computer uh, almost immediately because we I think we brought our laptop with us that time. Um, I think we took over 500 but, pictures. But you know what, Richard, you, you know what <laughs> happens though it, to, to some of my clients, you know, especially it's, it's amazing to me, the wealthiest ones. I, I, I don't get it exactly, but some of my clients they, they do that. They have their, their archive on the computer, but then their computer, they don't have it anywhere else. They don't have, yeah, you know, you've got to like, back oh, it up. That's, it, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Oh, yeah. You know, and so well, some of my older ladies, you know, it's like make, make something um, that you can hand to your attorney and have your attorney put it in your file or your accountant or get exactly. it out of the house. You know, have two, two stuff All because right. it, it, and it's- Upload it to the cloud. Now, yeah. you're going to have to answer her question very quickly because we're only going to have 90 seconds. Okay. Wow. 90 Wait, seconds to, to the end of the program. No, we need a couple more hours. I know that. You'll have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right. So stand by. We'll be coming back here in just a moment. <clears throat> in three, two, one, you're live. So I'm here with Scott Haskins, who's a disaster preparedness expert in regards to your stuff. And my question to him was, let's say we've got a few hours and we want to do something with our family photos. What would you, what oh, should you we do? You didn't say a few hours, you said a couple of days. Couple of days, okay. <laughs> okay don't cut me short. All right, okay. first, of all, first of all, you've got a couple of days, you've got 90, you've got 90 year old parents, get an oral history. Get them recorded, get their voices recorded, get some information. That may give you context for some of the photographs that you've got in your pile. Number two is while they're still around, label all the photographs that you can. Write on the back of them with a pencil and or if they're digital photographs, change the name of the, digi of the, of the file, but get them labeled. Who's in the photograph? When was it taken? Your best guess. And, uh, you know, because you can get the information with, from your sister that lives in Denver and you can talk to your parents. And those are the first two. Then if you've got, if you've got any more time in, the, in your two day limit, um, there are page protectors that you can buy from Staples or someplace that are going to fit your old original photos or whatever photo. And just, put, just throw them into those page protectors. That's the cheapest way to put together an archival scrapbook put together, I'll throw them into those page protectors and put them in a notebook and that's it, right? That's all the time I got? No, well, basically what you said is, I think that oral history thing is something that's really important and I, really don't, important. I never thought of that. Yeah, really. I important. think that, that's, that's fantastic. And there are books so, that will help you figure out all the questions that you have to ask. So before we have to go real fast, how do people find you, Scott? Uh, they can email me, F-A-C-L Art Doc at Gmail. My phone number, uh, my mobile phone number is 805-570-4140. And call and we'll chat. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. And the book is, the You're new the book coming, how, how, how to Save Your Pet in a Disaster, that's coming. But more importantly, this is the fourth book in a series about saving your stuff. Thank you, Scott. You guys are great. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> uh. All right. All right, we are clear. Very good. Wow, so, that, um, that went quick. Yeah, it does. Oh. So